It's been called many things, stopgap, grant, lee, or garbage. But nowadays, few surviving examples of this endangered species of tank still exist. Thankfully, we have a couple here at the museum, and we'll be talking about them today. This is the M3 medium tank. First, the basics. This vehicle is a medium tank, standardized in 1940, and yet it was still stuck with concepts based in the past. General Chaffee, commander of the United States Armored Force during World War II, said that the M3 tank had barely acceptable performance characteristics out on the Avondine Proving Grounds. But this vehicle was never necessarily meant to be our main battle tank during World War II. Instead, it was a stopgap measure on the way to the much more successful M4 Sherman medium tank. But regardless, today we're going to be taking a look at this vehicle and discuss its few advantages and numerous problems as it was out here working in the battlefields of World War II. We'll discuss not only its different types of weaponry, how it was built, but also its combat characteristics and how it performed in the battlefield. We'll do this by exploring the different types of M3 tank that we have right here at the Nash Museum of Military Vehicles. Now this is the M3 Lee, so it's a American variant of the M3 medium tank, and it drew a lot of inspiration actually from a French tank that's going to be the Char B1 tank. Now the Char B1 featured two guns, exactly like what our M3 is looking like here, and that's because its guns were designed for different purposes, with the larger gun in the belly of the vehicle, of course the 75mm cannon here, designed mainly for artillery support for advancing infantry, whereas the smaller 37mm gun up in the turret was actually supposed to be used for fighting tanks. Of course that's going to change a lot during World War II, so let's talk about the big guns, starting with the smallest gun that's actually on this vehicle beyond its machine guns, of course that 37mm cannon up there in the turret. During World War II, or at least at the beginning of the war, the 37mm gun was expected to be adequate for destroying most tanks on the battlefield, but in fact it was rendered almost immediately obsolete come 1940. So instead, everybody in this vehicle is really relying on this gun to do most of its talking, the 75mm cannon, which as I said before was really designed initially for infantry support. The armored force knew that we needed tanks to have 75mm cannons in them, but unfortunately when the M3 was being made, we couldn't produce a turret large enough to handle the recoil of this massive cannon. And again, that's why it gets placed here in the body of the vehicle. The 75mm gun in the hull of the tank also had a big limitation. It could only move left or right about 15 degrees for a total traverse of 30 degrees, which meant that the entire tank actually had to turn itself to fire its heaviest weapon at a target to its far left or to its far right. Note the counterweight here on the end of the 75mm gun. In fact, inside the tank, there was a gyroscopic stabilization system that kept the gun steady, or at least tried to most of the time as it moved down the battlefield. But unfortunately, this gun was sometimes off balance. In fact, there was another counterweight that it could be mounted up underneath the 37mm cannon for a very similar reason up in the turret, but that was not a typical feature and most of the time wasn't used. It would look like a small tube where the plug currently is underneath the 37mm gun. So now getting into the small guns, the main thing that this vehicle is using to fend off infantry is 30 caliber machine guns, and it has a lot of them. Two that are down in the hole, first off, that are mounted in a static position, meaning they can't turn left or right, and they're actually fired by the driver. Initially, those two machine guns were designed to just clear obstacles in front of the vehicle, and so they later actually get removed from later variants of the M3. Another 30 caliber machine gun would be placed up here in the turret as a coaxial machine gun that would be next to the 37 millimeter cannon. Unfortunately, this turret is missing that coaxial machine gun, but this tank was an Australian variant of the Lee, which was equipped with a British style hatch rather than the Coppola turret, and that turret would be equipped with another 30 caliber machine gun. The first M3 tank to actually reach a combat zone overseas is going to be this one that you see behind me here. This is the M3 Grant, which is the British version of the American M3 Lee. Now the Lee and the Grant are basically the exact same tank, with the exception of a couple of small differences that we'll talk about here in a moment. But really, the M3 Grant is going to be designed primarily, again, for the British, because they lost the majority of their armored vehicles after the pullout from the Battle of Dunkirk in northern France. Now, they needed a lot of new tanks to now fight with the Germans in northern Africa, and they originally asked American manufacturers to produce their own tank designs. But American manufacturers didn't want to do that. We insisted that they purchased our own tanks. And so, of course, that results in the creation of a modified M3 Lee. Of course, the Grant behind me. Of the almost 6,200 tanks that are built in the M3 line during World War II, roughly 1,600 of them end up being Grants. But what exactly makes a Grant different from an M3 Lee like we covered at the beginning of this video? Well, let's get into that. The only significant difference between the Lee and the Grant variants of the M3 tank is this, the turret. Now you notice how much bigger the turret is in comparison to the M3 Lee, and that's because we had to make it bigger to accommodate for the radio that now must be placed next to the tank commander. And that was something that all British tankers had to have in common in terms of their training. 
Now, when we think about the radio where it was previously located in the M3 Lee, that was actually down here in the hole. But again, by relocating it up here into the turret, we actually removed the need for a radio man, who is in fact the seventh crew member of an M3 Lee, and now it's actually only just down to six here in our M3 Grant, because the commander's pulling double duty. He's both the radio man and the tank commander. Another difference about the M3 Grant's turret versus the Lee is that the British actually added in this tube here, at least the space for a tube to mount a bomb thrower in the top of this turret. Now, the British called it a bomb thrower. America called it a grenade launcher. Either way, it could fire explosive or smoke ordnance to give the Grant some cover as it maneuvered around on the battlefield. Another interesting thing that the Grant's turret is lacking is going to be that Coppola turret that I was talking about earlier. So here now, instead of having a full turret up on top of the tank, we have a simple hatch like what you can see here. And if you go back outside and look at our Australian Lee, you'll see it has the same British style hatch. Notice the periscope as well on top of that hatch, which was a nice feature for the tank commander to use. The combat debut of the M3 Grant tank and the M3 tank in general is going to be in May of 1942 at the Battle of Gazala in North Africa. Initially, the M3 tanks were a huge problem for Germans out in the battlefield. Initially, the Germans, in fact, suffered losses, namely because the 75mm cannon on the M3 tank actually outranged their Pac-38 anti-tank guns. And the Italian anti-tank guns, such as this 47mm that you see here, was only effective at point-blank range. Now, eventually, these were offset by later innovations of the Panzer IV, the F2 in particular, which had a longer 75mm gun and therefore longer range, which balanced the playing field with the longer range 75 on the M3 tank. At the same time, to make things even worse for the M3, the Germans brought in the formidable 8.8cm flat cannon, also known as the 88. This initial anti-aircraft weapon, now used as an anti-tank gun here in North Africa, had an effective range of almost two miles, well outside the range of anything the M3 could bring to bear. And worse still, the M3 had to expose its massive height when it moved up and over hills to fire its 75mm cannon at gun positions like those manned by 88 crews. The height of this vehicle is a huge problem, and I mean that literally. You see me standing here, I'm about 5 foot 11, and then you see how much taller the tank is compared to me. This is a 10 foot tall tank, which out in a combat zone, especially in the deserts of North Africa, is going to make this vehicle incredibly vulnerable to shots from the sides. That also becomes a big problem when we think about the type of armor that this vehicle has all over it. That is, how was it made? The M3s were produced by three different locomotive companies here in the United States. That's going to be Baldwin Locomotive, Pullman Standard, and Press Steel. And unfortunately, their expertise lay in the realm of riveting. And riveting together vehicles in a modern war is a terrible idea. When these vehicles were tested at Aberdeen Proving Ground just a little bit after the Battle of Pearl Harbor, it was found that, in fact, the riveted armor on these vehicles was causing what was called spalling. And what spalling is, is the back end of the rivet shattering into a million pieces and then traveling about the interior of this vehicle as pieces of shrapnel. And again, that's going to hurt the crew. Worse still, we unfortunately couldn't change the already riveted versions of the M3 variants because, of course, they were all being produced by those locomotive companies, and we couldn't simply change the production lines around. Another big problem with this vehicle is, of course, all these side doors that we see here. There's two of them on either end, and unfortunately, they create another big weak spot in the tank's armor. Later versions of the M3 after the grant had these actually welded shut so they could increase overall armor integrity. Overall, the height of this tank, the way the armor was built, counteracted the fact that it was thick enough to repel some of those smaller caliber German arms, and so nonetheless, it made this vehicle incredibly vulnerable out in the battlefield. Speaking of riveted M3s, another variant of the M3 unfortunately couldn't be changed in the production lines either, and that actually leads us into our next variant of the M3 we're talking about here in the museum. It's the M3A4. This is the M3A4, and as you can see, she's absolutely massive. Normal M3 tanks would be using this right here, which is going to be our Continental radial engine, which would normally be used in not only other M3 tanks, but it would actually be later used in the M4 Sherman, the, of course, successor to the M3 medium. But the M3A4 instead is going to be using a much larger engine, what's called the Chrysler Multibank, which is made up from five separate inline-six engines strapped together in a star-shaped formation. And that's going to result in a total of 30 cylinders in the back of this vehicle. Furthermore, that massive engine weighed around 5,300 pounds, which accounts for almost two tons of this vehicle's weight. Also notice how this vehicle is missing those doors I was talking about earlier. Regardless, this vehicle is so huge because it needed to mount that engine. And that's really one of the big reasons why we know this vehicle here is very rare M3A4.
There were only 109 M3A4s built during World War II, and none of them left the United States, which makes this vehicle pretty rare. But how do we know that it's an M3A4? Well, normally you just climb inside the vehicle, check out the data plate that's bolted to the interior. But unfortunately, this vehicle is missing its data plate, and it's also missing that multi-bank engine, so we can't identify it that way either. But something that it does have is this space between the bogey wheels here on the bottom of the vehicle. And interestingly, if you look at any other variant of the M3, you'll see that there is not the space present between those bogies. And again, that space is here because the vehicle is so long to accommodate that massive Chrysler multibank engine. Another interesting thing about our M3A4 is, of course, the color it's painted in. A lot of people ask me, why is it almost lime green rather than the olive drab that we see a lot of our other tanks painted in here in the rotunda? Well, that's because the previous collector who owned it just had it painted that way. Or maybe he had it sitting outside for a while and it was bleached by the sun. In either case, it's historically inaccurate, and it's just kind of here in our collection because that's how it was brought into the rotunda. Another problem with our M3A4 is that it's missing that Coppola turret I talked about at the vehicle out in front of the museum. And unlike our M3 that's out in front of the museum, this one actually just has a big hole instead of a replacement hatch. And actually the bearing is still there that would accommodate that Coppola turret. But again, we don't really know where it went. At the beginning of this video, I called this vehicle a stopgap, which initially might sound like a derogatory term, but it's really important when we talk about the evolution of tanks here in World War II. The M3 tank, while it wasn't the most perfect, served its duty as holding the line until later tanks, better ones, eventually reached the battlefield, like the M4 Sherman that we see over there. And then the M3 wasn't just used in places like North Africa early on in the war. It actually served later on in the China-Burma conflict alongside the British, where it had limited success against Japanese light tanks. And it also even made its way over to the Soviet Union in limited numbers, although the Soviets really didn't care for it because it had a gasoline engine, and that caused it to catch fire quite frequently. They liked the T-34 a lot better. But overall, again, the M3 tank was really instrumental in, of course, evolving American tankery until we actually got towards the venerable M4 Sherman, which we've already covered on this channel. But if you have any suggestions for what you'd like to see next here at the museum, feel free to drop a comment below. But as always, I'm Hank Wilcox, and thanks for watching.